Hi everyone, this is Dr. Meyer here with the third and final installment of this video series on modulation. This video focuses on an advanced modulation technique used in the music of the 19th and 20th centuries called enharmonic modulation. Let's have a quick reminder about what enharmonicism is. Enharmonicism involves pitches and chords which sound the same but are spelled differently like this G sharp or A flat on the keyboard. Its spelling, of course, depends on the key or the scale that is currently operating. And while you probably learned about enharmonicism when you first began your study of music, this concept is very important for enharmonic modulation. So what does enharmonicism have to do with modulation anyway? Consider this fully diminished seventh chord on the keyboard here. How would you spell this chord? Consider the chromatic pitch space laid out in a clockwise circle and plot each of the pitches onto this circle. Observe how the pitch space is equally divided by this fully diminished seventh chord. That makes sense because we know that fully diminished seventh chords are made up of stacks of minor thirds. This repeated interval divides the octave evenly. However, we've still not decided how to spell this chord. If we begin on C, we must spell the F sharp as a G flat and the A natural as a B double flat in order to have properly spelled this stack of minor thirds above C. It would look like this on the staff. C, E flat, G flat, B double flat. Okay, we decided that this is now a C fully diminished seventh chord. But because this chord is symmetrical, we could start on any of the other points on the circle to act as the root, thus requiring a respelling of the chord. Let's take a look at the possibilities. The C fully diminished chord we spelled on the previous slide can be respelled starting with three other pitches as the root. If we begin on E flat or D sharp, we get a fully diminished seventh chord indicated by the green stars on the keyboard there. An E flat fully diminished seventh chord is somewhat of a theoretical chord and would be found rarely in music, which is why I've highlighted it in red here. However, the respelling on D sharp is always found as the seven fully diminished seven in E minor. The yellow stars indicate a fully diminished seventh chord built on G flat or F sharp. Again, G flat fully diminished is more of a theoretical chord. I mean, check out that F double flat, but you will definitely find F sharp fully diminished seven as seven fully diminished seven in G minor always. The final spelling of this chord is denoted by the red stars on the keyboard. The A fully diminished 7 is 7 fully diminished 7 in B flat minor, spelled A, C, E flat, G flat. Check out the vertical columns of these chord stacks so you can see how each of the enharmonic pitches are used in each chord to properly spell each fully diminished 7th chord. Note, in general, when you are finding a fully diminished 7th chord in your analysis, you should assume that it is originally from some minor key, as fully diminished sevenths are only found in minor. However, you may occasionally find a fully diminished seventh chord acting as a secondary leading tone chord, that is, a seven, fully diminished seven of major five, for example, uh, in which case you need to pay careful attention to which key you are modulating. This is the reason that I've suggested some major chords following the, the slashes up here. So F sharp fully diminished seven is of course seven fully diminished seven of G minor. But however, if it's modifying G major, that would be seven fully diminished seven of five in the key of C major. So just to make sure you know which chord your diminished chord is modifying as you are analyzing. Let's see this type of modulation in action. In this example by Schubert, he respelled a fully diminished seventh chord to enact a modulation. 
Listen along with the analysis to see if you can hear and identify the chord which is being respelled. In B flat major, the B natural fully diminished seventh chord is a secondary leading tone seventh chord of C minor. In the third measure, Schubert respells this chord to be a fully diminished seven in the key of F sharp minor. We see the diminished seventh chord followed by a dominant on C sharp, confirming that modulation to F sharp minor. Listen once more to hear the enharmonic modulation. The relationship of enharmonic spelling between B fully diminished 7 and E sharp fully diminished 7 can be seen in the spelling of both chords, where the F and A flat are respelled as E sharp and G sharp. There are several chords used to enact chromatic modulations. The chords that divide the octave evenly, like fully diminished sevenths chords and augmented triads, have only a few possible sounds and multiple spellings. So play them on the piano or plot them on the chromatic circle to see the symmetry as we saw before. Another way to enact an enharmonic modulation is to use an augmented sixth chord. The German augmented sixth chord sounds like a dominant seventh chord, but is spelled differently, with an augmented sixth above the lowest sounding pitch. So this chord can be respelled and have a new function as a dominant seventh in a new key. The same idea goes for the French augmented sixth, except that it equates to an altered dominant in your new key, so it's used a little less frequently. Lastly, you may see some advanced chromatic chords being used as pivot chords. These are not enharmonically spelled, but they do pertain to chromatic modulation, so I've kind of lumped them in here. Let's look at a quick example of enharmonic modulation using an augmented sixth chord. In the reduction of Mozart's string quartet, you can see an F dominant seventh chord used to modulate to A minor. Listen to this excerpt. <laughs> In the second measure of the excerpt, the F dominant 7 should resolve down a fifth to B flat, but instead behaves like a German augmented sixth chord, with an outward resolution to cadential 6 4 in the key of A minor. So, unlike in the Schubert example, Mozart doesn't actually respell the chord on the staff to use it in a modulation, but rather relies on the fact that it sounds like a German augmented sixth chord to create a convincing modulation. You will find both techniques in your analyses of Romantic Era works. Now it's your turn to practice. Respell the fully diminished seventh chord built on C sharp in the key of D minor to be spelled as the 7 fully diminished 7 in the key of F minor. Then, respell the given dominant 7th chord in the key of G major as an augmented 6th chord, a German augmented 6th chord, and indicate to which key that German augmented 6th chord belongs. Pause the video now if you need more time. For the fully diminished 7th chord, you should have gotten an E fully diminished 7th chord. Spelled E natural, G, B flat, D flat as 7 fully diminished 7 in the key of F minor. Notice how the C sharp in the first chord 
becomes D flat in the second chord in order to spell it properly in the new key. For the German augmented sixth chord, you should have spelled it D, F sharp, A, B sharp in the key of F sharp minor. Notice how the C natural becomes B sharp in order to spell it properly in the key of F sharp minor. It is a good idea to practice spelling and playing all of these chords used for enharmonic modulation so that when you encounter them in your analyses, you can be flexible enough to understand what type of modulation is going on. Here's what we learned in this video. Many chords may change their spelling and their function in order to enact a modulation, but they will still sound the same. Hence, the enharmonically equivalent chords. Chords like fully diminished sevenths and augmented triads divide the octave evenly, but will be spelled differently in various keys. Other chromatic chords, especially the German augmented sixth chord, sound like a dominant seventh chord and can be used to modulate enharmonically. It's important to note that composers of the Romantic era and beyond use these chromatic chords to explore enharmonic and chromatic modulations in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. So this is a very important element to put into your music theory toolbox. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.